Hi, I'm Father Joel, and welcome to Pilgrim Priest. Congratulations to Fathers Mark and Juan Carlos, who were just ordained to the priesthood for the Diocese of Green Bay. On this Memorial Day weekend, I'd also like to remember all servicemen and women who've died serving their country and the family and friends that mourn their loss. Thank you, and God bless you. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, that's the opening line of the Bible. The Bible begins with God creating everything. So who created God? I get questions from kids once you, they've studied a little faith formation. They're like, well, God created everything. Who created God? And I tell them, well, no one created God because God always was and always will be. And they look at me like I'm nuts. <laughs> the Bible doesn't start by explaining where God came from because God didn't come from anywhere. God simply is. And so when we get to the scene of Moses in the burning bush in Exodus, he asks this question. He says, so, uh, so when I go to Pharaoh and tell them, tell him to let my people go, who shall I say sent me? The he doesn't want to say, well, I saw this burning bush out in the wilderness and I decided I'd come and, you know, like take on the, the, the superpower of our day, right? Well, and God's response is, I am who am. Tell them, I am sent me to you. I am. God reveals that he is existence itself, that he is that all of us are in some way we came to be and we could not be. We don't have to be, but God simply is. The next thing that God reveals is that he is the only God. As it says in our first reading, I am the Lord in the heavens above, on the earth below and under the earth, and there is no other God but me that God is the only God, that there aren't a whole bunch of gods, there isn't a whole group of them, that everything else that is was created by God, but God himself simply is, and he is the only God, and he is the only one worthy of our worship. Now, when Jesus comes, he reveals something new about God, that the oneness of God is not a oneness of aloneness, it's a oneness of community that God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in one divine nature. God is three and one, or tri-unity. That's where the word Trinity comes from. It literally comes from three-one. God is three-one, and today we celebrate the three-oneness of God. It, it, what it reveals to us is that God in his very nature is a community of persons. He is in relationship. And that makes sense to us when we realize that God is love. God could not be love if there was just him by himself. How could God love himself? Well, because God gives himself freely to his son. The son receives the gift of the father and gives himself back to the father. And this total self-gift. It's sort of a cycle of self-giving. The father gives himself completely to the son and the son gives it all back again. And in this total self-giving love, the Holy Spirit is the spirit between the father and the son. He's that total self-gift. And so Jesus in, in, reveals that God is love. That's really another way of saying the Trinity is that God himself is love. It's not that God was lonely and he created us. God had everything he needed. God created us so that he could pour himself out to us so that we could receive his gift. Of course, we all know that the gift of God's love is like trying to fill up a water glass with the ocean, right? That will never run out. And so we are surrounded by the love of God. We are part of the Trinity. Our baptism actually incorporates us into the community of the Trinity. And that means that each and every one of us is surrounded by God's love. Now, we, we may not often feel that way. We may sometimes feel alone or distant from God, some of which could be our fault. But the reality is that we'll never experience the fullness of God's love for us until we get to the next life. 
So here on earth, we have to continue to live it. We have to continue to live it in faith, even when we can't always see it, even when we can't always feel it. As Christians, we realize that because God is a community of love, therefore we are called to communion, which is really what the gift of the Holy Eucharist is about. It's us having communion with the God who loves us. But it's also what marriage is meant to be. It's meant to be a total self-gift. It's meant to be the husband pouring himself out to his wife and the wife giving it all back again. And in that total self-giving, the two become one and then three in one. As Dr. Scott Hahn likes to say, your love is so real that nine months later you might have to give it a name. (laughs) And so you can see how the human family images the Trinity. And then our larger human community, our parish community and our communities of people were meant to be in love, in a community of love with one another. And as nice as that sounds, yeah, 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 we often don't live that way. We often don't live that way because when we pour ourselves out to others, we find ourselves sometimes taken advantage of. And we realize, man, I was vulnerable, I was honest, I was open, and, and she used it against me. I'm not going to do that again. And we build these walls to protect ourselves, to protect ourselves from being used, from becoming empty. We can only truly love as we were meant to love when we actually live within the life of the Trinity, when we allow God's love to surround us and to live from that place of his love. And that's why I think that it's harder and harder to stay married. It's harder. People aren't investing in community as much as they used to. Why? Because we're not inserted in the Trinity the way we're meant to be. And so it's hard for me to give generously if I, if no one's giving to me. And so you can see how the world gets colder and colder as, you know, more and more isolation breeds more and more isolation. Uh, I don't see love modeled as much in the human community as it should be. Well, I think, of course, we're each made to be in that image of God, so we should be modeling God's love to others. And it starts with me. It starts with me staying rooted in the Trinity and then learning to love you with a a tiny fraction of the love God has for you. And I think that's the same for each of us, each of us finding a way to, to be rooted in God's love so that we can love others generously. And in doing so, we have the power to transform the world, the community around us, our relationships, because we're drawing life, not sucking each other dry, but drawing life from the infinite trinity so that we can generously pour it out to others. That's why Christians need so much to remain in God's love, to remain in the love of God. I hope that you've experienced in one way or another the infinite love of God. Perhaps you haven't. Perhaps you've been going through the motions of doing the church thing, but haven't yet felt God's love for you. It doesn't necessarily mean there's something wrong with you, and it doesn't mean there's something wrong with God. It just means God has a beautiful plan. So pray for that. Ask for that. Um, But also be open to the ways that God is already loving you that are subtle, that are all around us, And in many ways, when God reveals his love, it's not that suddenly we feel loved, but all of a sudden we realize what all those moments actually meant. Many different ways that God has been loving us. I think this is an invitation of the celebration of Trinity Sunday, is to open our eyes to that reality all around us. Our second reading talks about the inheritance that we have waiting for us in heaven because we've been adopted as God's children. And that means we'll only experience the fullness of God's love when we get to eternal life. We're not going to experience that here and now. But what a beautiful thought of this infinite love of God, this perfect goodness that's, that's waiting for us. And I think that can give us the courage to live a little more simply here and now to focus on the things that matter, to worry a little bit less about having it all together or having it figured out or, or what everybody else thinks of me if I know that I have this inheritance waiting for me in heaven. There's a story a few years ago about a couple of homeless brothers. They were living in Hungary. Uh, I guess Hungary is a bad country to live in if you're homeless, but uh, they were Hungarian. 
They were living, they were so poor they were living in a cave and surviving by selling scrap so that they could uh, make enough to buy themselves food and depending a lot on handouts. And then they got contacted by the authorities who informed them that they were the last remaining next of kin to a very wealthy woman. I'm not making this up. Apparently their mother was a very difficult person. She had cut ties with her family and they knew she'd come from a wealthy family. But she cut ties with her family and then she abandoned her own children. And so when her mother had then died, the grandmother of these children, she left a fortune of seven billion euros to these two homeless brothers and their sister that lived in America. I don't know her, but I wish I did. <laughs> How would you live differently if you knew that you had an inheritance coming? Do you think, can you imagine if one of those brothers had given up and committed suicide because life's, you know, life's terrible and it's no good for me? Uh, only to discover that this huge fortune was awaiting him if he'd just been patient enough. Well, that is literally the situation that we find ourselves in because God has this enormous inheritance that he plans to give us. So it's okay to be poor here and now. It's okay to struggle. It's okay to not always make ends meet, whether that's uh, materially, financially, or emotionally. Like, we, we need to keep living as God's children, confident that God has this incredible inheritance stored up for us in heaven. That everything we're, we, we, we truly need is going to be supplied for us. But also, God is already with us. Jesus says that he will be with us always. And that means that he's not as far away as we might think. In fact, we are, each of us, already surrounded by the love of the Trinity. As I said, we can't always feel it. We can't, we, we just experience it in little glimpses. But we need to keep living in the light of God's love until we come to that inheritance that God has prepared for us. And this is the truth of the Feast of the Holy Trinity, that God is a community of love, that we're meant to live within that community, and that if we live as God's children, we have an infinite inheritance awaiting us. Little Johnny is standing in the back of church and he's staring at a plaque and it has all these names on it. And uh, the pastor comes over and says, Johnny, do you know what that is? And Johnny says, no. And he says, those are all the members of our congregation that died in the service. And Johnny's eyes get really wide. And he says, the 8 o'clock service or the 1030 service? <laughs> 